welcome to another episode of Disaster Empire Quick Views. This is the podcast where we talk to thought leaders and innovators in resilience. I'm Ashley Guzman, and this may be a familiar face to many of you. David Linston, thank you so much for being here today. Really excited to have you on the channel and also really interested to talk to you today about things that you're thinking about as they relate to adaptive business continuity, resilience, and I think we might touch on AI and lots of topics that all of us, I think, are thinking about right now. So, David, welcome to the podcast. Excellent. Well, great. Hey, let's start talking about adaptive business continuity and resilience. What is on your mind right now? Okay, cool. Folks so um, let's start off with the, this, like, the, the legal disclaimer, right? So it's probably a good idea. Um, good so idea. all the opinions that I'm going to express do not necessarily reflect any of the organizations with which I'm associated and might not even reflect my own because uh, I think kind of what we want to talk about, Ashley, is, is, is some thought experiments and, and looking out a bit into the future. Um, so let's, let's start with a, a, a bit of a thought experiment. Um, and this is kind of where my my mind has been going lately. So let's look a few years into the future, and I don't think it's going to take that many years, but you pick a number. It's two, it's five, it's whatever. And let's talk about artificial intelligence, but you know, not in the, in the spooky way. Um, I can well imagine, uh, given the amount of data that some of the risk management business continuity systems are gathering and bringing together. I can well imagine that you as a business continuity practitioner walk into the room uh, to do business continuity session with an area department or function or whatnot. And so much of your work is already done for you when you walk in the room. So let's talk about the BIA, right? So um, given the data, given artificial intelligence, given the, the learning and, and the, the amalgamation of all the data into single places for analysis, your BIA is done. Uh, it knows um, all the people that are involved in, in all the different processes. It's able to uh, chunk that up into the main different processes that are done for, let's say, a payroll system. Uh, it knows how much payroll makes, so it knows what an outage would cost. Uh, it knows who sends the most emails to which people. So it can say, oh, well, these are probably the most important people in the sort of leadership areas. Uh, here are the dependencies because I can see the financial data. I can see the purchasing data. I can see the email traffic. I can see the tickets. I can see all right. So you have everything populated, the business impact. So uh, what would be the impact of losses to are they on social media? It checks those things. Uh, it, so everything you want to know about the BIA is done there for you. And then more so because I can go into chat. You and I can go into chat GPT right now and type in a few sentences and create a business continuity recovery plan for payroll. You can. I've done it. Um, so a couple of keystrokes. And now I have uh, my my business continuity plan um, and I can start to feed in some of the information from the BIA into the prompts that I use for chat GPT to create that plan. Um, and I can certainly have chat GPT create an exercise for me. It's pretty good at that things too. Actually, we've done that as well. Um, we can even go on. We can have uh, some other systems create um, the video uh, like a newscast. Um, so for the exercise that I want to do at the end, I've got the, the newscast that I populate with this, that I got from this, that I got from the data. So here's my question, and here's, I think, what we all ought to be thinking about right now, which is, okay, do I have a job in five years as a business continuity planner? Am I going to be replaced by a junior artificial intelligence analyst um, or maybe just a business analyst who's worth their salt uh, because they can go into the room and they have the tools, the techniques, the prompts, and boom, I don't have a job anymore because there's nothing left. So I think and what we ought to be thinking about quite carefully is we often set business continuity up as a system of deliverables, the BIA, the plan, an exercise, and the training. And if those are the key components, if delivering these particular deliverables, sorry, mm -hmm 
are the, are the thing that makes me a business continuity planner, um, then I think we ought to be careful about uh, how we're really framing up our industry, our profession, our work. I'll stop there. I have a lot more things that we can go from there. I think there's a lot of things that trickle out from there, but let's start with that because, well, I'll stop there and, and see yeah. what you think. And I'll just just respond to that, that um, I'm actually excited about those aspects of of AI as a support because, at least in my experience, I see those as the most onerous aspects, if you will, <laughs> of the work um, and the time what I spend the most time on or have spent the most time on, but it isn't getting me to the meat of the work, which is really what are the strategies and what is the risk that the business is able to um, endure or take on? What exposure are they willing to have? And I, I have felt like most of the time I don't even get into those deep dive conversations. And the other aspect, you know, we're seeing, and I'll let you respond, you know, we're seeing in, all of the trending and literature and and gurus and right all of the influencers really kind of professionals talking about is the importance of soft skills and AI can't do that. Yeah. AI right can only collect what you ask it to do and that's another skill by the way as you have likely seen from your experience even trying to get something out of chat GPT or another like system is that you have to know how to ask the right questions. And the other piece that I don't think it replaces and I, I think this, you know, aligns with your concept of adaptive BCP is that strategic aspect and also being able to talk to leadership and being able to present that in a way that in your company's culture, they're able to absorb and respond to. So I will pause there and let you respond to that. Because yeah, no, I, that's, I, that's I don't all right. see that's us exactly. losing our jobs. I, I see us as accelerating us into the roles that we really should have. Well, opinion. it could. And let's hope that it and does. Let's, that it does. Um, let's draw a bit let's of a, a parallel a here. So, so I think in a way, yeah, we got okay. a little got lucky, a little lucky. Um, after COVID. I think it could have gone a lot worse for our industry. I think we were able to pivot a little bit. But most of us, you know, going into COVID, yeah. typically the meth the the message was well, business continuity is about BIAs and documented plans. We didn't use BIAs and documented plans for COVID. Therefore, we didn't use business continuity for COVID. And I know some people did lose their jobs after COVID. I know a lot of leaders were and still are asking the question about what the hell is the value of business continuity? I didn't use it in the biggest disaster our company has faced in years. Um, and now I think part of the reason you're seeing a pivot to op res um, and other sorts of more strategic level attempts to do business continuity is for just that reason as well. You know, either business continuity is compliance or it's uh, getting these documents together. So it will be, so I think the same challenge is going to come again and even more so with these new tools, these new possibilities. And I think the question is, if we continue to tell leadership, we continue to tell regulators and auditors and anyone that'll listen that, well, the reason you do business continuity is to get these documents because this is what's going to help you are these these written instructions, these um, these lists of uh, priorities, which, uh, of course, I don't I don't think work to begin with. But that's another conversation. Um, but if that's what Let's our job is, you. then we may be out of jobs because someone else does that. Something else does that for us. So now, so let's flip that around a little bit. So on the adaptive side, um, what we say is, well, that was never a big portion of what a business continuity planner should be doing, is doing uh, in the first place. What are you doing? Well, look, quite frankly, and I know we don't like to talk about this, but we're getting human beings ready to function during significantly adverse circumstances. And that's not done and this is something we've seen with the with covid uh with the Christchurch earthquakes with hurricane katrina right those prioritized lists of of critical functions to recover 
in a real disaster, particularly a prolonged disaster, those go out the door. Um, that's not what helps us. Um, lists of things, uh, point by point directions, that's not what helps us. What helps us? And what helped us during COVID? What helped us during Christchurch? What helps us during anything that you faced that was significant? It's capabilities, right? What, what am I talking about? Look, it's the, the ability for people to come together to have some of the soft skills to get along and not kill each other during the bad times and not get so upset with their customers that they're hauling off on them. But it's the, it's the strategies, it's the creative thinking, it's the, and the resources. There's a very hard aspect to this as well. Look, if you're a manufacturing company, you don't have another manufacturing plant, you're not doing manufacturing unless you have a lot of capital to put together and then still just taking you six to blah, 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 right? So it's those resources resources, those strategies, and those uh, capabilities, those competencies to be able to function. So yes, if we are thinking in terms of business continuity as getting people and processes and functions ready to well, function eh, under adverse circumstances, <laughs> then our work has really just begun. And this is a fantastic tool for us. Like, great. I don't have to do a BIA because I don't really think it helped us very much anyway. We probably already knew where to start. We knew what's most important overall. Um, in a real exercise, those lists go out, those priorities go out the window, depending on what's happening, because disasters are way more complicated than we give them credit for. Now I can say, great, I've got this information. I know who you are. I know what you do. But now let's talk. Like, what are you really going to do? Because you have a different culture. You have a different background. You have different experiences. We have, I think, in one of the conversations I was having, like, you know, Fred, who's afraid of spiders. Okay, well, we you no know, spiders for Fred. So it, it, the, the number of variables involved in, in business continuity planning doesn't lend itself nicely to a documented plan that I can get from chat GPT. So I think our work is just now really beginning, but we better start framing up our work in the way that lets us continue to do that in the future. So David, what would you recommend? Is you've got to start thinking of business continuity. And this is sort of the kind of the hallmark of the adaptive approach is think of business continuity in terms of capabilities. It's getting that organization ready um, from a capability standpoint. Um, you know, the, the funny sort of thing, and, and Ashley, I think you and I talked about this before, in our related disciplines of in business continuity, so emergency management, crisis management, cyber, all these things, right? What happens in a disaster? So the, the cyber people come in and say, don't touch your computers, don't do anything, get out of the way, we're taking over. And with the lawyers and HR and communications, great. All that. What happens in a crisis, um, crisis management? Uh, oh, something bad has happened. Don't talk to the press. Don't talk to social media. Don't talk to anybody. Get out of the way, let us do our job. Emergency management, something's wrong with the building. Get out of the building, get out of the way, let us do our job. All of these related disciplines. Let's come back to that in a minute, because I think that also sets a bad precedent for business continuity. But business continuity is like, uh oh, something bad's happened. Time to stand up. You're taking a role. You're going to be the leader. You have to figure out how to get payroll back up and running without your payroll system, without half of your people, without the one person who has access and the authority to, to run the payroll. I mean, what we're doing is, is the opposite of what so many of our compatriots do, which is we have to make the lay people more able to deal with uncertainty, uh, with uh, the disaster situations, with misinformation. It's, a, it's tough. If it wasn't tough, then there wouldn't be anything to talk about. So there's a whole bunch of things we all can be doing. Um, but think more now of, look, you know, if that's my job to get people ready, I ought to be shifting a little bit in my approach to how I'm doing that. Um, you know, what's really funny, Ashley, is that you you mentioned soft skills. Um, so in in my research for my uh, most recent book on organizational resilience, boy, soft skills came up time and time and time again, uh, particularly in prolonged disasters. And this isn't just like... Um, oh, yeah, that's anecdotal evidence. Now, there's actually research around that, particularly from the Christchurch earthquakes uh, and some research coming out of COVID. 
that particularly in a prolonged disaster, uh, those soft skills come into play. So here's another little quick interesting thing, right? So one of the research that came out of Christchurch, and this is a decade ago. I mean, this, this research has been out there for us to learn, and we haven't really paid much attention to it. So during the Christchurch earthquakes, at any one time, about 50% of your staff are thinking of leaving, seriously thinking of leaving in a disaster, post-disaster, prolonged disaster. Well, what happened during COVID? Same thing, right? 40%. 40% of people, by and large, overall, either left or were really, really thinking of leaving, right? We had all the turnover. We had all these things. Was that about money? No. It wasn't about striking for more money. It wasn't about, what was it about? I wasn't heard. I wasn't listened to. I wasn't cared for during a difficult time. Look, let me tell you, people are thinking about leaving now, let alone when it gets, and it's an interesting little curve because as things get bad right from the beginning, and I've seen this in managing projects as well, when things get really bad and, and busy and hairy, uh, people stay because they feel, and rightly so, some loyalty, obligation to their coworkers, to their organization, to their job, right? We, we're just, that's yeah. what it means to be a human being. Yeah. People stay, when things settle down enough that they feel comfortable, their colleagues or organizations are going to be okay, they go. So what was the point of all of that? The point of all of that is to say a lot of what we need in the post-disaster situations, disaster situations, crisis situations are these soft skills. And I'm and this, and no one's going to want to talk about this, but look, empathy, caring, active listening, giving a really caring for your colleagues, your customers, your, your employees, that makes bottom line dollars and cents. This isn't touchy feely stuff. Oh, wouldn't it be nice? No, this is like you lose 40% of your workforce if you don't do this. Now, can you imagine going to leadership and saying, hey, as part of my business continuity program, I want to teach active listening. Uh, as part of my business continuity kind of program, I want to bring in, uh, so we're going to do the BIA and we're going to do a risk assessment. And then we're going to do two weeks of training on soft skills, uh, active listening, design thinking, like you can't do it, but that ought to be a pretty glaring indication that something's not quite right. Cause we probably should be doing that. All right, and then last, last interesting thing, then we've, I've said too much, obviously, but so going all the way not back to all. the first point there about colleagues, right? So what we have for leadership, for pretty much anyone who's like, I don't know what business continuity is. I don't care. I got a job to do. They often think of it in terms of something like, oh, it's like cyber. It's like ITBR. It's like crisis management, right? I can get a few people. They'll come up with plans. They're the experts. They'll go do it. And then it'll be done. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. But business continuity is a unique animal okay. in that it doesn't work. It doesn't work that That's way. That's not how you do yeah. that. Yeah. So what are your what are your recommendations? So you've had adaptive business continuity out there as a concept for a while. Can you share more with the audience about what that is? Does that help in this environment, do you think? And I know we want to get oh, to talking about organizational resilience as well. So, right, adaptive. Um, well, I don't want to get into a ton of detail, but essentially what adaptive is, um, it starts with a set of, of principles. Um, and those principles talk about what's, what's most important. And, um, what's most important is, um, boy, you know, it's been so long since I went through the principles. I don't even remember them off the top of my head. Um, but things right. like document for mnemonics, what does that mean? Well, the only reason that you're writing things down is so you can remember them later, not to read them for the first time, uh, after a disaster, um, make iterative improvements. So everyone has these capabilities, but every time we're meeting with someone, the focus should be on increasing those capabilities, not on documenting something, not on, you, you know, we collect so much data um, for ourselves. Uh, you know, you think about your typical risk assessment and business impact analysis, both of which literally can take years if you did them together for a large organization. Okay, so I, let's say I take a year, I have the perfect BIA. It's actually reliable. I don't think so. Um, it, now I have that document in front of me. What did that just cost me in the organization in terms of labor and money and effort? And then now, how much more prepared are you to recover from disaster now that I've collected all that data for my program? 
Any little? I, a I little. Found the, Not yeah. nothing. No. I mean, I found the value more in the conversations of what you were talking about earlier, which is helping people to get prepared. Oh, yeah. So they feel like they have some sense of control, if you will. Right. When something bad happens, like, okay, well, there's a framework here. I may not have all of the answers, but I know that we do have a framework in place. I do know who the players are. I know I can contribute to that. Here are some ideas. I may not know exactly what to do in X situation, but we've talked about why. And here's where it could be transferable. And that's where I've really found the value. And in fact, sometimes in my experience, people are not going back to the plans, right? As as you've talked about, because I've worked with traditional coop plans and I've worked with traditional right business yeah. continuity plans, they might go back to the data. And what they're really going back to is those strategic conversations of, okay, what would I do in this situation versus the checklist, <laughs> right, of, of process steps for recovery. And I do understand, right, in the IT space, in the DR space, there's some value to that. But even then, I'm hearing from my colleagues because I sit more on the operational side. Well, they're not even using that. There's no run books anymore. There's no a playbook that's hardly valuable. It, it's that framework aspect. And that's what, at least in, in my understanding so far of the concepts of adaptive you know, business continuity, that's what I'm hearing the value is and, and putting some you know, guardrails around that, so to speak. But you let Boy, me know if exactly I'm on the right, right track. <laughs> no, I mean, that's exactly right. But, so, but I'm a crisis manager, yeah, so. <laughs> well, and here we go, right? I mean, now we're back to things like, you know, muscle memory. We all know how important that is. Um, trying something out and practice and discussion. You know, a typical approach to doing business continuity is to, going, is to go in and talk about a lot of concrete answers if they're even possible, but we pretend they're possible. We pretend that you could rate something on a scale of one to five and something a four is more meaningful than a three, but whatever, come back to that later. But we go in and we ask a lot of concrete questions. Give me the name for this person. Give me the number for this thing. Give me the amount for that thing. What's the order of this thing? How do you do this thing? And it's very, in a disaster, that is not how the brain needs to work. It's typically how the brain does work. First of all, the brain shuts down and now you start to, get it. that's a whole nother thing. Cognition um, goes you know, down, but, right. That's right. I mean, so think about how you're training military, how you're training fighter pilots, how you're training uh, uh, airline pilots, how you're how you're uh, training a football team. You know, and maybe that's a great example. It's like, look, you don't give the military unit a list of point by point instructions uh, for what to do when they encounter something problematic. On the taglines of our emails, we say things like. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. It's not the plan that's important. It's the planning. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> you should take your own advice there. Um, that's what really happens. So how do you get the, you know, the football team ready? How do you get, well, you know, you come up with high level objectives. Yes. And that's right. You practice all sorts of different plays. You practice also, but you probably also practice some creativity. You practice team dynamics. You build that unit together as a cohesive whole. Um, you give them the resources they need. That's nice. Um, and you practice and there's muscle memory. I mean, there's a whole buildup and none of those things are uh, okay. You know, you're going to do these 23 things to catch Osama bin Laden. Um, that's just not how that works. Um, but again, this is all wrapped up. So you ask the question of what am I going to recommend? What should people do? Change your frame of mind. If we continue to say these types of things that like, okay, business continuity is about deliverables. It's about the BIA. It's about documents. It's about, uh, uh policies. It's about, um, it's like our colleagues that I can come up, I'm going to come up with a set of plans and, and distribute them. And that's what I'm going to do. We, we've got to talk instead about the, uh, the capabilities and getting human beings ready for adverse circumstances. Now, Here's the bad news with that. Boy, it's a lot easier to sell a BIA and a policy than it is to sell. Right. I get human beings ready to recover from disaster. Now, here's the next thing, though. It's a VUCA world. And we should probably also change our discussion about what it is the business continuity is actually preparing us for. 
Because if it's for the smoking crater in the ground or the, the, the big disasters or those types of things, which they should be, but if that's only what we're talking about, that's a, quite a disservice. If we're getting people ready to not only survive, but theoretically thrive under adverse circumstances, well, adverse circumstances are pretty much a couple times a week, maybe. I'm exaggerating. But, you know, it's a volatile uncertain VUCA world. Uh, it's complex. It's non, It's unpredictable. Go read your, um, uh, your Talib about um, anti-fragile. Uh, go read your information on um, the uh, Kinefin framework. But do some, do, some, do some reading, do some research. What's it really like in a disaster? What's it really like day to day? So point being, if we can get people ready to deal with the unknown, the unpredictable, the uncertainty. Well, now we're not just talking about disasters. Now we're talking about mergers and acquisitions. We're talking about layoffs and restructuring. We're talking about bringing in a, a new ERP system that's very disruptive. Um, there's all sorts of uncertainty and difficult situations to deal with as, as an employee in today's world. We could be providing that service as well. So I think, yeah. So Ashley, back to, I think, maybe your very first point of the conversation. A lot of opportunity here. Um, and let's both be excited about it, but let's frame it up properly. And let's start thinking about it in those types of ways. How do we take advantage of these opportunities to build the capabilities that allow our organizations to become more resilient, more able to deal with the world as the world is today and will be in the coming years? Well, as we wrap up our conversation, so, you know, what is a business continuity planner to do? Because, you know, businesses are based on process and they're based on functions and, you know, being able to connect and explain all of those uh, maybe amorphous yeah. aspects, if you will, to your leadership and to your colleagues. How would you frame up providing that as a service to help make an organization resilient? So there's a How couple do you think of, we I mean, there's lots of different ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And that's not an easy question, obviously. It's a very, very it. difficult question. It is. The answer, like a lot of things in, in Adaptive, is it depends. I mean, what are your leaders thinking about? What are they listening to? What are they reading? What are they worried about? I suspect that they are worried about both the regulatory impacts of things, but also surviving and thriving and continuing their business in the future. Um, there's all sorts of ways to try and frame that up, um, you know, and get rid of the jargon. Talk to them at their level and talk about what they're worried about. Uh, there's a number of ways to do that. But, you know. So here's a couple of quick examples, right? Instead of business continuity, we sometimes we could talk about bonus continuity, right? Um, look, part of what I'm here to do is make sure that you are getting everything done no matter what happens so that you can all get your bonuses at the end of the year. You can meet your quotas. You can get things done that you need to get done. Um, leadership, I'm preparing... I'm preparing your organization, the people in your organization to be a bit more resilient, to be a bit more flexible, flexible. to be a bit more able to deal with the changes that we're going to throw at them. Um, you could even say, you know, a good colleague, a great colleague of mine, uh, Howard Manella, he always said, and it took me a while to understand this. He's like, business, con business continuity is not like insurance, right? It's like a hedge. So, you're paying pennies on the dollars to hedge your bet that something isn't going to go wrong. And you can think about we spend so much time and money and effort trying to prevent the bad thing from happening. Fair enough. We should. And over here, we spend time and money insuring so that when the bad thing does happen, because they happen, we'll get some of our money back. But for pennies on the dollars, we can help to lessen the impact of the bad event so that maybe you don't even need the insurance at the end. And it's going to cost us just a little tiny fraction of our money to be able to do that. But the more that we can create the capabilities in our processes, in our functions, have the resources. And again, 
We don't like to talk about soft skills and those types of things, but this is dollars and cents, bottom line, capital money that we are talking about here. The challenge that I see there, David, before, you know, I, I let you go and is that I think for a lot of professionals in the field right now, they're used to compliance. And in fact, I don't know oh, if sure. the global climate, so to speak, is helping because Regula right? The regulations for operational resilience, you know, cyber, et cetera, is coming into play yeah. even more than it has before. So people are feeling that pressure to comply, right? So I think there's going to be, if you will, you know, friction between what you're talking about, which is yeah. end goal and really building resilience, but also meeting the requirements of regulators and, and local legislatures and, and lawmakers. Yeah, boy, well, you're right about that. Um, and there's a number of ways to, to think about that. You know, one being, if you have to do the compliance route, which you will, um, can you spend a little time getting the processes, the people, the soft skills, the, 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 the it, again, and just talking about the strategies and the workarounds and the options. Can we create a portfolio of options and resources to be able to use in a disaster situation. So I think there are ways to build that into the work that we're doing, right? We bake in, we sneak in, smuggle in some of these things if we have to um, into those sorts of processes. What I suspect though, and you brought up op res, so I think there are going to be opportunities such as operational resilience, where the goal is something like looking at not a department, but a value chain in the organization and bringing in the different pieces, not only of the value chain, but of the protections of the value chain, like cyber and ITDR and emergency management, those types of things. Now we're having a rather strategic conversation about how to protect our value chains in a number of different dimensions. And I think there we really can have some very interesting discussions that are not going to be, all right, let's all nice and dandy, but let's do our BIA now. Um, we're going to be talking with, all right, holistically speaking for this value chain, how do we protect it? How do we ensure that it continues? Um, and I think that goes nicely with some of the compliance. You know, if we're looking at DORA, we're looking at the things coming out of the Bank of England. Um, we're looking at, uh, oh, well, okay. First of all, there's a lot of nice dependency mapping. That's great. Good to know our dependencies. Good to know. Those give me all the Achilles heels that I can start planning for because I'm going to take those away. Um, but how about the legislation coming out of California and the EU that's talking about mapping uh, your uh, supply chain because we want to know where does it come from? Is it coming from good actors, good places, we, you know, and what's the carbon footprint of that? These are all new questions that are not your typical business continuity things. Okay. And some of that will be answered with data and some of it won't. And we'll have these larger discussions. It makes me think that, you know, value in being consultative to the business and especially to senior leadership and just recently read uh, Deloitte's paper on their board excellence recommendations for the year. And you know, one of the things that stood out to me there, uh, multiple things did, as well as AI that we we're talking about earlier, but also boards functioning as crisis teams, right? And really having an understanding of what to do for their resilience for the organization during crisis. So all of that, to me, opens the door for the things that you are talking about. It's how do we pivot and position ourselves to be strong in that area versus to what you said, being the process compliance oriented uh, aspect, but knowing that we're going to have to probably continue to do some of that, at least in the short term. Well, let's not yeah, again, and let's not be overreactive. Let's keep our jobs. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Um, let's really think carefully. Uh, here's the thing, right? Let's talk about it. Uh, we we don't spend a lot of time, even at conferences, but we don't spend a lot of time pulling back from our day to day work to have conversations like this. And even this one's a little forced because here we are talking in front of people. We got to be careful of you know, what we say. But you know, have these conversations uh, amongst your peers, amongst other people. And like, what is this all going to mean? 
Uh, and I guarantee the decisions you come to this year are not going to be the same ones that you come to next year. Um, and let's, right. let's, these are not simple questions uh, with, uh, you know, silver bullet answers. We need to be talking. Absolutely. Well, I know I'm curious to see how everything evolves. And I thank you for being a thought leader in this space. Hey, what do you have coming up that if the audience, I know I'll, I'll link to your profile on LinkedIn for folks to get a hold of you and, and to the adaptive business continuity uh, website and to the books. But what else do you have coming up that you want to share that people could engage with you in? Just a quick note that we are doing a, an adaptive business continuity class this summer. Uh, it's going to be eight weeks, 11 guest instructors. And we're going to learn as much as we teach. Again, part of what we do in our courses is to, to have cohorts and have people across the industry, across the globe, across different uh, industries um, come together and talk. What's working? What isn't working? What's it like out there in the trenches? And what can we expect? And what can we do better? Um, so if this is of interest, you want to network, you want to talk with your peers, you want to have some of these discussions, uh, come join the course this summer. It's so important that we're out here having these discussions, bringing some of these topics up to people. Again, we're so darn busy. It's not easy being a business continuity planner. Um, and we're all so busy and we're all out there. We're just trying to get the work done and do a good job. Good for us to step back once in a while and say, okay, how is this all going for us? Are there, are there things we could do better? Are there things we should be doing differently? And a, a show like yours really helps people to, to have it, even if I can't have the conversations in person to be like, okay, yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. I need to think more about that. My hope is for the industry, we get ahead, meaning we have those conversations more often and are pushing forward our recommendation versus them coming from the regulators, which unfortunately, to my mind, continues to happen. But I know that groups like yours and, and what you're advocating are trying to do that. So I commend you for it and really thank you for the conversation. David, thank you so much for being uh, Thanks, on Ashley. the channel. Very good to be really here. enjoyed it. Thank you. I know we could keep talking all day. So <laughs> I suspect we could. I suspect we could. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you.